All right, welcome back everyone. So now we have the so second talk of this session. Uh, so we'll have uh, Samuel talking about conditional independence of 1D GIP states with applications to efficient learning. So Samuel, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks for the introduction and also thanks to the organizers for having me here. And um, this is joint work with Paul, Alberto, Alvaro and Angela. Um, and uh, before I want to talk about conditional independence of 1D GIP states um, and learning, I just start with like something kind of off, top, off topic and um, which in my view kind of motivates this work, namely um, gap ground states in 1D. Um, ground states in 1D are something that's computationally very hard, but it has been found a while ago that if you assume a gap on ground states in 1D, um, then you can prove something about them, namely that they have a, a way an area law for the Rennie entanglement entropy. If you don't know what that is exactly, I'm not going to explain it, it's not important for the talk. Um, so result by Hastings a while ago. Um, and from this result, which is like an information theoretic criterion on these gap ground states, it has been proven that they have efficient uh, matrix product set representations. So some kind of compressed tensor network description of these gapped ground states. Um, in 2006, by Vestrata and Sirac, and later on, this has been extended. You can't, they don't only exist, you can also find them. So they are efficient algorithms proven a bit later. And I like this kind of story of you start with some physical assumption, namely the gap on the ground states and the setting, and um, you prove something about information theory on these states, and um, which is a more general criterion. So now you can like, well, first of all, it's just an information theoretic result. And later on, when you say this implies efficient algorithms, you could also potentially extend it. I mean, in this case, it's not true because they're actually all equivalent. Um, but potentially, um, if you know this information theoretic criterion, you can just check it and get this algorithmic efficiency afterwards. Um, so this is the side story. And in this talk, we talk about 1D Gibbs states. And, and as you might guess, I want, a, I want a similar story. And that's not how it has been proven. So for 1D um, Gibbs states, these tensor network representations have been found. They're mostly explicit constructions. But part of the motivation of this work was, can we still, despite the different proof, reproduce this story? So can we start um, from these 1D Gibbs states as a physics assumption, find some information theoretic criterion yet to be determined, Spoiler, it's going to be something with conditional independence, conditional mutual information. You saw it earlier in the plenary talk. And then use this information, like this, this information theoretic criterion, to go at least to an efficient MPO representation. And it turned out we can. This is kind of the outline of the talk. And as sort of the, the corollary of the whole work, it was like the additional application is that we can also learn this representation. Um, OK, just one boring slide with a little bit of notation. And we talk about 1D Gibbs states. You think of a, of a chain of, of spins. Each of them is a finite dimension Hilbert space. Um, and we define a potential function which maps each set um, subset of the chain um, to a Hamiltonian term supported on this subset. Um, think of these as a Hamiltonian terms. Mostly they will be finite range. But in fact, our ex results extend to those being um, exponentially decaying. So the, the norm of these terms decays with the system size of this x. I will always, for the moment, put my, my chain in, in three pieces, which is why I always have the sub-indices ABC. And you always have a Hamiltonian, which consists of all terms that are supported in the subset ABC. Um, our terms will also always be translation invariant. Um, the inverse temperature is beta. And then we define the Gibbs state, which is the inverse exponential of this Hamiltonian divided by the normalizing factor. Sometimes we'll talk about margins as well. So if there are um, subscripts instead of superscripts, these will be um, local marginals of the skip state. Um, I will come to this later. OK, so conditional independence, as I said, is the thing that we want to prove. There, there are several notions of correlations in one Gibbs states. We could talk about the care of correlations, about mutual informations. But we care about conditional independence. And this is characterized by the conditional mutual information, which in the standard version is given by this formula. So you take a difference of some entropies. Or you can also see it as um, the amount of slack in the strong subjectivity, which is the decrease of a relative entropy of rho ABC to rho A tensor rho BC when you take the channel being the trace on C. So if you remove this system, how does this um, quantity decrease? And this is something that characterizes quantum Markov chains. So as soon as this quantity is zero, it's possible to take a map from B and reconstruct this row ABC by just the information in B and the state on row AB. Um, 
yeah, this is when they're exact, and there's also an approximate version of this um, given by Fauzi Renner. In addition, it also has like other nice interpretations. You can give a structure result. And so overall, this quantity is quite well motivated. Um, what we do is we use a different one. Um, the one we use is basically take the definition from the previous slide, but replace the relative entropy by the so-called belafkin sosevsky relative entropy, which is a different generalization of the, of the standard classical one. So if, you, if, you, if these operators commute, you can just take them apart. And this first line is just the same as the, as the kulbach leibler divergence or the, or the omigaki. Um, but as they don't, um, this is in general a different quantity. There's kind of a literature and information theory about how to motivate this. Um, it is a different generalization, so it extends the classical case, but still it's not 100% clear why in this context this is the right quantity to look at. Um, our motivation is just that we have results for it and an application. So kind of one motivation for it is just what I'm going to tell you later on. Also one warning on the slide, I'm going to mess around with this definition a bit. It's possible, there, there are a few different equivalent definitions of the for Neumann CMI. You can, for example, put um, identities here instead of the row A's. Um, we're going to switch them around a bit. The results hold for all of them. So whenever I, I exchange some of these quantities, don't worry, the, the decay results that we're going to achieve are all going to hold for all of them. Um, but they might be inequivalent in the setting of the Belafik and Sosevsky. Okay, so similar to this, what I just said about approximate Markov chains, there's a similar analogous thing for these um, Belafik and Sosevsky um, relative entropies. So if you have these sort of Channel, so this data processing quality that this quantity is um, greater or equal to zero because a channel or, in, or a bunch of maps on, only decreases this um, quantity. Then, if it's zero, you can recover with one map this state sigma from, from E of sigma, and the same map also recovers rho from E of rho. This is a bit more general than what we, what we had before, but later on we will pick this um, channel being um, the trace on the, on the C system. Um, and the interesting thing that we want to first ask is, this is also an approximate um, equivalence. So we will first just go in the right to left direction. So if this recovery condition is approximately fulfilled, do we still have approximately zero um, belafkin stevsky condition reach information once we plug in all the correct channels? And we find such a bound. So this is one of these versions of the belafkin stevsky conditional mutual information. And it's a bit hidden, but if you look at this thing here, this is zero exactly when this channel, um, this recovery map exactly re it recovers our, our state. Um, so this is a quantity which we want to upper bound. We think that this should go to zero if the recovery map does a good job. And here are a bunch of prefactors which look slightly scary, but later on we will find out why we don't have to worry about all of them. Um, yeah, so the trick behind this, I'm not gonna go into the proof, but just roughly, it's basically a long computation, in, including a lot of Hölder inequalities and an integral representation of the logarithm. Um, but just like this is one side of the result, you first relate this um, condition which information, this entropy quantity, to these recovery maps. Um, and the second step, you want to basically just prove that all these, like, these factors on the previous slide are either bounded or decay. And for this, I just want to briefly introduce one technique um, that's interesting for this. Um, for, for 1D Gibbs states in general, which is Iraqi expansion is. Um, you take sort of something that looks like the Gibbs state here, just unnormalized on two systems, X and Y, neighboring, and you compare it to the inverses of the Gibbs states on X and the Gibbs state on Y. Um, we're just currently ignoring some partition functions. And the, the idea is, okay, if this is a commuting Hamiltonian, then clearly all these Hamiltonian terms cancel, except the one that goes from X to Y, so it would be strictly local. Um, and the result from Iraqi, which is basically has been proven a while ago, basically you have this operator instead of being strictly local and bounded, it's still bounded, but it's quasi-local. So if you take a slightly bigger region, you can approximate it very well. In effect, this approximation is super exponentially well in, in good in the distance you take around the, the cut between X and Y. Um, and basically like a long list of lemmas proves that this ingredient is basically what you need to bound all these three factors and to prove that this factor decays super exponentially fast, which gives us our first result. This is information theoretic result on the Gibbs state. So this was like first implication I showed in my original motivation. 
Um, you have some kind of scary exponential blow up here. However, you find a super exponential decaying function. So as you take the stripe partition ABC and you make the B system larger, the conditional mutual information decays very fast. Um, and if you go to, this was for finite range interactions. And as I mentioned, you also have exponentially decaying interaction. In that case, the decay is only exponential and it only holds above a critical temperature, which is kind of in line with all results we have for 1D Gibbs state. So it's basically nothing that doesn't break down um, below a critical temperature for 1D Gibbs states with exponentially decaying interactions. Um, okay. I already talked about some kind of recovery map. We found there are several ways of arranging these recovery maps, and you can get slightly different conditional image information with slightly different recovery maps. And there's another one which looks a bit more complicated than the previous one. It does not have any more as the previous one trace preservingness, but it is opposed to the previous one, it's completely positive. Um, so you have like a factor here, and it's adjoint on this side, so you clearly see this is a completely positive map. And it's another version of a recovery map for the, for the BS relative entropy. Namely, if you take this channel and you try to reconstruct, okay, this time I went the other direction, but if you try to reconstruct the A system of a chain by a channel just acting on the B system, like from B to AB, and in ignoring the C part, you can reconstruct row ABC from row BC. And so there's an upper bound, if the CMI here, slightly different version again, as I warned you, if the CMI is small, then the recovery channel is good. Again, we will find separate bounds for these prefactors here. Um, so this was just, sorry, one recovery. But what we want to do is we want to find this tensor network representation. So we want to break up this chain into small matrices. And these matrices will actually be the recovery maps. So what we do is we make like a um, chunking. So we take little chunks that are sufficiently large that from our first result, the conditional mutual information that we are interested in are already very small. And then we take the state on A1, reproduce the state on A2 by acting on A1, reproduce A3 by just acting on A2 and ignoring A1, and so on and so forth. And um, so you have this chain of recovery maps that is a good approximation of the, of the full thermal state on the, on the N subsystems. And as I said, what I want is I want a sufficient criterion for the existence of such a tensor network representation or recovery map um, chain um, reconstruction. Um, and we have sort of, uh, we try to write everything as an information theoretical quantity, everything as an entropy. And um, this is the one we talked about before. So we have a decay result for this one. It has been previously proven that this one, the max mutual information is actually, has an area law, so it's uniformly bounded. Um, and for this one, we have the result also somewhere hidden in our paper that these two factors are uniformly bounded and this gives us a decay for Gibbs states. Um, so you have a more general criterion, but for Gibbs states, it's fulfilled. So for Gibbs states, you get an efficient approximation. Um, yeah, with this chain of recurring maps. Again, this is like intrinsically a positive decomposition. That's not always true for a tensor network representation. But since we use these completely positive recovery maps, it's kind of a nice little, little extra that this comes for free. Um, <clears throat> okay. Finally, as we advertise, we also talk about learning. The learning is kind of straightforward. So once you look at this map, it's completely positive. What does it actually consist of? It just consists of all these marginals. So the idea behind the learning is just, well, since these are all things, we just do local tomography. Each of the system sizes isn't too big. So we just basically throw any standard tomography results on all these factors um, because it's an explicit um, formula in terms of marginals. And we use just like standard tomography on the system sizes. The system sizes are less than log large. Um, so we get each of them can be learned polynomial time in inverse error. And in the global system size, because the global system size does not enter into the size of the marginals. Um, and you get a bound, a bound on the bond dimension, which is basically given by the size of these recovery maps um, and, a, and a runtime bound on the, and on the sample complexity and time complexity of the learning. Okay, so this is already where I come to the conclusion, just to like wrap up the, the steps that we had before. Um, we proved this super exponential decay of a certain form of BS conditional mutual formations. Um, there, there are two steps involved. One is just like we go from 
from this quantity to a um, data processing quality with, with these recovery maps. And then in the second step, once we have these recovery maps, we use this technique that are, is kind of crucial for most results in, in 1D GIF states, which are these Iraqi expansion ads. Um, what's new is this, like this recovery map was actually known before, but we also introduced a new recovery map, which is kind of the opposite side of the state processing inequality. It's a strength in data processing inequality, um, which allows us to give this tensor network construction. So we have like a result on how well this um, recovery map reconstructs um, systems with a small BS condition which information. Um, chaining those maps together gives us our MPO reconstructions, which we then can also learn by just measuring marginals. Um, a thing that I didn't quite pack into these slides, but it's sort of similar techniques than the one we used, um, allow us to also learn the purity, so the trace of the squared thermal state, which is kind of a different, different result on something that's sometimes compared to, to entropy. It's related to the two Rennie entropy of the global state. And it's in general hard to learn. Um, but with a similar factorization trick, we can also learn the purity. Um, but I'm, I'm skipping the details for this one. Um, feel free to ask questions or look at our paper if you're interested. Um, and finally, I want to comment on something related since after we um, published our results, um, we found that or there was a result as well on the von Neumann condition which information, how it decays. Um, so you could ask, this was kind of the original quantities that was more well, better known, probably also better motivated than the BS um, condition information. The question is, can you do similar things? And the answer is mostly yes. Um, on the one hand, one sort of thing is, I mean, I say, I say weaker result here, but it's still a really good result, um, which is the exponential decay of the condition information, but it does not extend to the slightly stronger super exponential decay, and it's not known to hold for exponentially decaying interactions where you have this high temperature result for the exponential decay interactions. So there's like a, a tiny difference in, in the extent of these results, but still you have um, the decay of the standard condition mutual information. And then the question is, could you do an analogous construction for these MPOs? And the answer is also yes. In general, you can use so-called rotated pets recovery maps. You have to use rotated pets recovery maps because the standard ones um, only work in the exact setting, but the rotated ones would work similar to ours. I haven't looked into the learning. I presume it would be similarly possible. You have to get into the details whether all these um, error propagation bounds from approximate marginals still go through. Um, but this would be an alternative route now since this result also exists. This is just a comment on the comparison to something that, that came up afterwards. And we, um, but still, is, we still have some settings in which our results sort of are not covered by this. All right, um, and that's the end of my talk. And Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Samuel, for the great talk. Do we have questions? Yes. So I, I didn't get what is the temperature bound here. I mean, it doesn't hold for. It holds for all temperatures. The temperature dependence is bad, but it holds for all temperatures. It doesn't break. The what? Sorry. Um, the temperature dependence should be. When beta goes to infinity, do you still have an area law? Surely you don't have an area law. Um, you will still have decay of conditional mutual information. An area law um, oh. should break down, yeah. Okay, but then it should. So, so no, an area law actually also holds. Is it in one D, an area law also holds at arbitrary high temperatures? No. I mean, you have QMA hard things. I mean, I don't think you have. Uh... So I mean, you have, the, you the have bounds, a ground state. It's going... very bad with the temperature, but they have no critical temperature where they break actually down. But then you it, should, not, you should not expect an area law in that case, right? Hmm? You should not expect an area low uh, and nor an efficient MPO representation for the ground state. I mean, it's a... Uh... Fixed arbitrary temperature. Yeah, okay. But it becomes temperature worse. Should, temperature. Dependence should go in there and, and make the, the bound worse and worse. Yeah, yeah. But at a fixed temperature, you can still do it. Oh, yeah. It should be the, the dependence, I think, is doubly or triply exponentially in beta. So it's, it's absolutely not great. But for, as soon as you fix it, you can still do it at any temperature. Um, thanks again for the talk. Um, I want to. You assume that the that the underlying state can be written as an MPO, or do you also have to do some truncation? And um, so there were known results on that you can write it efficiently as an MPO before, but the the construction we use we actually prove on on the go sort of that it is an efficient representation. So the construction is. 
um, exactly this. Um, and this is part of our proof that this is an efficient MPO representation. Like there's an, an exact finite bond dimension for the Gibbs state. Like there's no... Well, so, sort of, okay, the, it's not exactly, the, there's an approximation in the tensor, but we don't afterwards truncate the bond dimension. The bond dimension that comes out of this construction is already polynomial in, in system size and in the error that you want on this, on this side. Okay. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much for the talk. Just a question about the translation invariance. Can you relax that? Maybe that should be a follow up also. Uh, is there anything known about trees? Um, regarding translation invariance, so far I have no idea because these results that we use, and as I already mentioned, these results are not exactly novel. So they have been around for a while and no one has managed so far to extend to non translation invariant. So I would say it's definitely at least very hard. Um, for trees, for trees, kind of similar similar answer. This is just the, the technique that's definitely yeah crucial to what we do. So I can't tell you about trees either. Please. Uh, okay. Thanks for the talk. So um, first question: Is it but to think about possible extension to two dimensions? So is it a relevant question to think about? I would say. Um, it's a random question. Okay, one answer is the same as to the previous question. This thing is just 1D. Second answer is um, things have to be harder in 2D. There's, there are no phase transitions in 1D, but there will be in, in 2D. And maybe a third answer is it's very unclear how to do these chain recoveries. If you if you go on a, on a 2D lattice and you try to like construct patch by patch your, your thermal state and use recovery maps to construct it, then if, as you grow the size that you've already recovered, the boundary grows as well. So such a such an idea of like, yeah, chaining recovery maps is very complicated and should actually not work in higher dimensions usually. And uh, another question. So for the EPO construction that you have, what, what are, I don't know, possible physical application? Uh, like, I don't know, for example, for MPS, you have classification of phases of matter. You have different things. So for the MPOs, what could be? Possible physical application out. Um, okay, if you say classification of phases of matter, there are no phase transitions, so there's nothing to classify in that sense. Um, if you okay, one interesting thing maybe to mention that this is not possible is this is not a channel what we have. So these are recovery maps. Might have misused the word at some point, but these are recovery maps, no channels. So one thing you could think of is like Gibbs sampling by. Um, just actually applying these channels, this is not possible since these are CP maps. If you want to make them into uh, trace preserving, you kind of have to scale them down and we'll end up with a probability of failure in each step. So you get like an exponentially suppressed probability of actually managing to construct your state. Um, however, I think this is something that would be possible if you use the von Neumann instead. So that's a downside of our result. We don't have an actual physical channel in this MPO reconstruction. So it's just you should see it as just an American technique. Thanks. Um, well, we actually have time for one more question. So I want to ask a question. So you uh, mentioned learning of purity. The purity will typically be exponentially small. So what's the um, figure of merit you're using to recover? Is it like log of the purity or? Uh... Uh, we wrote down the purity, but it would be a um, um, multiplicative approximation. Multiplicative approximation. Okay, thanks. All right, then uh, if there are no further questions, let's thank uh, Samuel again.